So I, I promised you a Thanksgiving tea. And here it is. Uh, it's a. Uh, well, come on down. So, this is uh, our own Professor Arnold, uh, who has been the head of the microparticles for the physics lab. Evgeny, you didn't say you had such a large class. This is larger than I expected. So uh, what I've come to talk to you about is sort of a journey that I made in trying to detect, uh, to create a biosensor. And I created it because of the death of a friend of mine uh, who uh, unfortunately died of complications from a viral infection. So that motivated this whole thing. And what went on since then is, is basically um, a device which has led to 5,000 research publications. Not from us, but all around the place. So, um, so I've titled this NYU Poly's Ultra Sensitive Whispering Gallery Mode Biosensor because we basically conceived it here. Rockefeller University helped to demonstrate some of it, and more was demonstrated here. This is the logo for the laboratory called the Microparticle Photophysics Laboratory. And I wanted to make this, when it was designed, an east-west logo. Okay? So where is the east? What is that thing? Anyone? Really? What is it? It is the Chinese symbol for light. Yeah, exactly. Don't worry. These international people, they're going to love it, this whole thing. <laughs> you shouldn't worry about that. And, um, and they're going to need to know what NYU is, okay? So this is not something I would normally do in a classroom here, but um, but I think, so it was important to do here. I mean, they have to know that we come from where? New York. New York. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And I wanted to tell you about the motivation. I don't know if you've ever read any books by this guy, Isaac Asimov. He's the one who wrote iRobot. He also wrote 515 books of average length, 300 pages each. Can you imagine? It sounds impossible somehow. But unfortunately, he required open heart surgery, which was elective, meaning he, you know, the doctor said, you need this. And he went in, and he needed transfusions. So this was in the 80s. They gave him transfusions. But there was HIV in the blood transfusion. So later on, about 10 years later, he developed AIDS. And that led to complications, which led to his death. So good reason to try to detect the virus, right? And there wasn't anything then, and so we decided we would design a way to detect virus. We would detect them down to one at a time, one viral particle at a time, none of this ensemble stuff, right? And we'd also try to figure out a way to actually measure their size by using the sensor. So now we're talking about a sensor that can possibly act as a size spectrometer as well. And um, that's what this talk is really all about. So it's about pathogens. Those things which, when they get into you, make you sick, right? We're interested in pathogens now. So it turns out that when people used to get ulcers, that happened, and then stomach cancer, they thought that was due to frustration. Yeah, they say, hey, you're frustrated, you got this. But the reality was that it was due to this bacterium. That's a pathogen. Um, 
This is the Helibacter pylori bacterium. It's, it's about three microns long. Obviously a large object. Well, small by our, you know, by our standards of length, you know, the length of our thumbs or something. But that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in something that size. So compare it to this. That's the size of an HIV virus. It's about a tenth of one micrometer, okay? And if, and if I blow it up by 35 times, that's what it looks like. So there's a lot of machinery in there, genomic as well as other machinery. There's even a capsid covering the thing. And there are these epitopes sticking out from it. It's 600 atograms, atogram being 10 to the minus 18 grams. <coughs> whereas this is three million atograms, so much smaller. And then the protein, those things which need to be essentially capped off by antibodies in order for keeping this stuff from getting into a cell, those things are even smaller. They're a tenth of an atogram. So we're gonna to try to detect each of these one at a time, ultimate sensitivity. Okay, no compromise. The, the problem is that you need a philosophy for detection. You can't just, uh, you know, start off, I'm going to detect it. So what we did was basically shut down the laboratory and try to figure out a way to do this. Before that, however, I had a discussion with this man, Joshua Lederberg, who was from um, Rockefeller University, who claimed that the virus is now the biggest threat to our planet. No politician, right? A virus, <laughs> okay. And, uh, and it turns out viral particles are being detected and cataloged by the National Institute of Health starting in 1994 because they realize bacterium kind of infections, that's sort of old hat from the last century. Now it's all about virus. And they're disease vectors for all kinds of things. Okay. Women understand this because of the various vaccines that are available for various things. Also men understand this for other vaccines and so on and so forth. The question is, how would you possibly detect them? And, uh, and, and here was the great puzzle, you know, you, you know, what do you do to try to detect these? Well, you need some kind of philosophy. My philosophy was I didn't believe molecular spectroscopy was the right way to go. I say, you know, forget that. I'm not going to look at the signature that light gives because proteins are large things, right? They're complicated. Well, I don't want to read this whole thing, but to give you a feeling for it, for example, in a sensitized person, an allergic reaction to certain toxic proteins on the surface of pollen causes a specific antibody to engulf the invading allergen like a lock covering the key. Okay, that's how, that's how your system detects the allergen, right? It does it biologically, right? So, you know, do all that spectroscopy. Maybe if you had to do that, nature would have put light inside your body, right? But it hasn't. So if we mimic biology, we recognize bioparticles through dark interactions. And by that I mean the following. Things like this. Antibodies to detect virus. Oligos to detect hybridization with complementary oligos. And you could even think about non-specific sort of things that reverse the charge of a surface and allow things to accumulate on the surface. So, after taking on the philosophy, there was a question, right, that occurs, you know. Okay, fine. But suppose something comes to a surface and these things are there and they cling to it. That doesn't mean you're going to detect it, right? That just simply means something clung to the surface. 
how do you detect something? You need to transduce. You need to uh, have something say it got there, right? And if we're not going to use any fluorescence, and we're not going to use any absorption spectroscopy, we got to co <laughs> go with something else. And by the way, the, this, this, this way we're going to do it is called label-free. Okay, we are going to put something on the surface that's sticky, makes these things come, come there and stick. And that's the way it identifies them. But we're not going to label the analyte. So I, I was sitting watching, uh, there's a wonderful place in New York City called the 92nd Street Y, where they have, uh, you know, recitals. This guy, uh, Yitzhak Perlman, was playing the violin, right? And uh, I was listening to him play and wondering what would happen if a dust particle landed on the string. So I only need one volunteer. What do you think would happen? Yes? Uh, it's white where it changed. The what will change? The, 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 the voice where it changed. The voice. You, you mean the tone? Yeah. The tone. Yeah. yeah. I guess that's exactly what would happen. The tone would change. Well, okay, so that gave some idea. Maybe I could measure the frequency with which it oscillates after a dust particle right, gets on it. Okay, so this, this is a frequency spectrum. You know, when you look at your iPhone, you know, every time you bring up some music, you see a frequency spectrum. Well, this is the frequency spectrum of a violin string, right? So there's a spectrum. And after something clings to the surface, that little delta M there, the spectrum will shift. So if I could measure the shift, that would be great. There's a little problem. Before I get into the problem, let me tell you what I would ex be expecting from this. I expect the shift to be comparable to the width of the line. Otherwise, I'm not going to see it. It's got to move enough. And I can write that as the shift divided by the frequency times the frequency divided by the line width. This, this is sort of what comes from the transduction, the shift. This factor, omega over the line width, comes from dissipation. Okay, so one thing has to do with transduction, the other one has to do with dissipation. Dissipation changes the width of that line. Okay, another volunteer. What do you suppose may be the problem in using violin to detect a virus? Yes? The string is too big for one virus that St comes on. String is too big. Yeah. yeah. Well, in the case of these kind of things, they're kind of inertial. So the string, the string has too large a mass. It, it, that's exactly the right answer. So it, it turns out that the shift in frequency divided by the original frequency is the mass of the thing that falls divided by the original mass. But a virus has a mass of 10 to the minus 16 grams. And a violin string has a mass of 10 grams. That's a change in, of a part in 10 to the 17th. However, the line here is only a, the line here is a part in a hundred. <laughs> You're never going to see this thing shift by one part in 10 to the 17th. It's ridiculous. But it was a thought, right? It was something that you could think about. So I wanted to teach you one little principle here, really important. It's a, it's a, the, the principle is this. This is that line width measured when you do it in the frequency domain. The way you do frequency domain is you shake this plate at a certain frequency, and then what happens is this thing begins to take on energy, right? And you measure this width. But there's also another way to get equivalent information. You could, you could simply bang on the string and watch it slowly decay away, right? The amplitude. Turns out, the product of the line width times that time to decay away is one. It's a very, okay. 
So if you want something with an incredibly narrow line width, you want something which will decay away after being hit by a hammer in a very, very, very long time. An analysis of the violin strings showed that once you pluck that string, in order for it to be sensitive to virus, the decay time would have to be 30,000 years. It's kind of ridiculous, right? It doesn't make any sense. So that's not going to work. You want something that rings for a very long time after it's hit with a hammer. What does that? A system with very little dissipation. Yet people still believe in violin strings. I mean, the, the place which is considered a, one of the best engineering places in the entire world, right? C California Institute of Technology created this violin string. It's two millionths of a meter long. It was created by lithography, nanolithography. When you pluck it, it vibrates. And they did it to detect mass of viruses, protein, and things like that. What's wrong with this? We, we, want, we want our device to operate in body fluids. We want it to operate in urine. We want it to operate in blood. We want it to operate in saliva, right? What's wrong with this? I'll take a volunteer. Yes? Um, those fluids would affect the way that it's vibrating? Yeah, so what do you think it would do? It would Well, you, do you think that it would, uh, it, so if you started it vibrating, you think it would damp down quickly? Yeah. As if it had a shock absorber on it, right? Right. It's exactly right. I'm not, I'm not going to give any terrible words about this because this is going to be on a video, right? But I, I would say that this $3 million project sponsored by DARPA is in fact the wrong approach to actually detecting body fluids directly, okay? It's a very bad idea if that was what the intent was. Okay, so Q is a really important thing. Q defines that line width, right? It is the frequency divided by the line width. You want Q to be very large. So we discuss some cues, right? The thorax of an insect, Q of 2.5. So why does an insect have such a low Q? That means that whatever he, you know, like a cricket, it makes a chirp, it has to disappear very quickly, right? Vi the vibration has to end very quickly. Well, obviously the cricket's lifetime is not very long, right? He doesn't have time for the mating call if if the chirp is going to last 30,000 years, right? He hasn't got an opportunity whatsoever, right? So you, so this is exactly why nature defined, made him this way, right? Integrated circuit filter Q of 20, mechanical wristwatch between 100 and 300, surface acoustic waves 2,000, a pendulum in air 10 to the fourth, quartz crystal, 10 to the 6. The watches that people wear on their wrists that they buy in the subway for a buck and a half, or you go to Canal Street and get them for three bucks, right? They're based on quartz crystals. The vibration of a quartz crystal. Mechanical wrist watch is a Rolex. The Rolex costs $8,000. Q stabilizes watches, makes them more constant. So why would you pay $8,000 over $1 to buy something that's not as accurate, right? The answer is, it's eye candy, right? What's eye candy? 
It's like a gold filling in your teeth, right? It's eye candy. People buy it for fashion. But if anybody's wearing that and tells you it's accurate, you just walk away from them. Optical microcavities. This is another class of things. It's an optical object that can contain light over a long period. But the problem here is, can it operate in a solution? Okay, so it turns out the first experiment ever done was done at Poly on, it was a discovery, a small bead, 15 millionths of a meter in radius, was put onto the surface of an optical fiber that had been shaved down. When, when you shave down an optical fiber, you expose something called the evanescent field on the outside of it. That evanescent field, when the laser was tuned, was causing a spectrum that looked like the spectrum of an atom. So the guy looking, that was my eye actually, but it, I don't look like that. So <laughs> looking through here was seeing the light blinking every time it went into one of these resonances. And it was recorded over here. So apparently there's something about that little s solid, effectively, piece of polystyrene that in fact makes it resonate, makes it oscillate. So why does it work? Well, it turns out the, the external light was creating this. Light was held by a total internal reflection on the inside of that sphere. And total internal reflection, at least on a flat surface, has no losses. Obviously, in a curved surface, it's somewhat different. Now, here's where we're going to talk about a little physics. This is, you could call this a ray point of view, right? Rays. But you could also call it a photon point of view, as if a photon were skipping around there, a particle of light. Anytime you have a picture like this, you have the equivalence of a picture like that. This is called the wave-particle duality. To go into resonance, it meant that the wave was biting its own tail. When it did that, just as in hydrogen, it went into resonance. Okay, that's really important. The order of the resonance, people talk about that, is the number of wavelengths around the outside. Here there are many. That's why it was working. So the question really is, what is the large delta omega, or what is the large delta wavelength? How big would it be? Okay. Well, began to think about this. So here's that wave contained within that little sphere. And what we're going to do now is we're going to deposit on its surface some protein. It turns out protein has about the same refractive index as silica glass. There's the protein. This is in a, a particular order, meaning a certain number of wavelengths around the outside. What will happen after we deposit the protein is that the orbit's going to grow outward because it looks like you just made the sphere larger. So that the effect of wavelength circulating is going to be larger than it was before. And as a result of that, every one of those resonances we saw before in that thing that looked like an atomic thing, right, atomic spectrum, will shift. So it turns out it's not very hard to work out what this change in wavelength is compared to this wavelength. You've got two similar triangles. So you just take some ratios. So the shift in the wavelength to the original wavelength is the same as the thickness of the layer deposited divided by the radius of the original sphere. 
Well, what it meant is once you write this down, it means you can estimate the thickness based on a certain wavelength shift. You just have to solve for thickness. Here it is. Now, suppose we, we, we required that this thing shift by one line width. Well, then all we would do is substitute for the shift one line width. Well, it turns out a line width divided by the wavelength is just one over the Q. And the Q was already measured for these things to be t between 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 7. I took an intermediate Q of 10 to the 6th, divided it into a 10 micron radius, and got 10 to the minus 11 meters. Now, I guess we have to have some realization of what that is. Okay, so question to you. What is the diameter of hydrogen? Anybody have any idea? Right, he's a shill. I, I was kind of <laughs> One angstrom, but you've got to tell us in meters. Okay, so 10 to the minus 10 meters. So 10 to the minus 10 meters. That's uh, Mohammed over here. So a tenth of that is 10 to the minus 11. So what this was saying is, not only could we detect a layer of things, but they could be a tenth the diameter of a hydrogen atom. This, right, amazing. Okay, it's amazing what you can get out of simple math in this case. So the question really that comes up is, is there any com competition for this? About 10 years ago, General Electric bought a company from the northern part of Europe by the name of Biacor. Biacor had invented the surface plasmon resonance detector, which can detect antibody antigen interactions. It never has measured a single protein or anything like that, but still, it's the standard. They paid a whopping $400 million for that company 10 years ago. How does this compare to that? Note, note here that we said that we would shift by one line width in 10, over here, 10 to the minus 11 meters, but a protein is on the order of three nanometers in size. So what is the ratio of the size of a protein to the size of 10 to the minus 11 meters. Well, if we went all the way up to nanometers, we'd be going up a factor of 100. And if we up to 3 nanometers, we'd go up a factor of 300. So let's see what the response of the surface plasmon detector is. This is for a full layer of protein. The shift is only one line width. Ours would have shifted by 300 line widths. So, the conclusion is simple. It takes a layer of three nanometers thick to cause a shift of one angular line width here. That makes the WGM, the Whispering Gallery Mode, device 300 times more sensitive than surface plasma and polariton. No wonder that there are several companies now uh, uh, dedicated to, to basically developing these WGM sensors. Can we make it all photonic? In other words, this idea of looking with your eyes, you know, or, or scattering coming off the edge of something, well, you don't want to do that, right? This shows uh, something called a distributed feedback laser. I have to tell you how long it is. It's on the order of a fraction of a millimeter long very small, right? The sphere over here, the one we were talking about before, is even smaller than that. Remember, 10 micrometer radius. So I've had to exaggerate to show you this. When you change the current through the DFB laser, distributed feedback laser, you, you can stimulate that resonance. And when you do, you create a dip in the light coming to the power detector. So you see directly what's going on, and you don't really have to let any light out. I mean, you, you can just put this right up against that. The whole thing is very compact, 
and much, much, much smaller than the size of an iPhone. This was originally, uh, this implementation of the DFP was made by Griffel and myself and others in, uh, in the late 90, 1996 period. So, having, having done all this, and I, I, I began to think about what the next step was. After all, the interest was in detecting virus. Began to think, you know, what are we going to do? We, we don't have any, at that time, microfabrication here at Poly. So, a young student, a fellow had taken my, uh, an honors course I was giving, came to my office and he says, well, you need microfluidics. I said, we don't have the, you know, the capability of that here. So, but you need it. Okay, I said, what do, you, what do you propose? He said, go to this URL. Okay, I could see that it was um, eBay. I went in, looked, and it was a little milling machine. The milling machine had end mills that were very, very small. I said to him, this thing has motorized XYZ. Do you know how to run it? He said, no, but get me a book, okay, and, uh, and buy me this thing. I said, how much is it? With computer, $600. So I took my credit card out and figured, well, it's probably a good investment in the next grant, you know, and paid for it, and, and it came. And he began to sleep in the lab until he got it all done, and within a month, I had microfluidics as good as anybody else's at the time. And here you see this microfluidic cell made out of PDMS. There's the micro cavity, which he stuck in here. He also made digital pumps so he could send the virus in and fluid. And here's that uh, DFB laser that comes through here with a fiber and so on. And um, I had to present this in, uh, in England at the Faraday discussions of the Royal Society. And, and you can see he did a great deal. His name was David Kang. Then we had a problem. David didn't know any chemistry to speak of, and, and we needed to functionalize the surface of that microcavity. So we hired on a chemical engineering student who had just gotten his PhD, and he created in one, two, three, four, five steps. He first put a silane compound onto the silica so it would bond. He then opened up the bonds. A lot of steps later, he added the antibody for one virus. The virus was MS2, something we could handle in the lab because it wouldn't infect anybody. There it is. It's really small, 25 nanometers across. This is something similar in size but slightly larger called Phi-X-174. And what happened next was that he took his apparatus, added the antibody for MS2, injected the, the MS2 virus. When he injected the MS2 virus, the wavelength began to shift because many viruses came to the surface and clung on to these antibodies. And then when he tried to wash off the virus with some PBS, right, with buffer solution, it wouldn't come off. So that sounded good. When he went to the Phi X174, which has a different genetic makeup, still using the same antibody, they even clung harder to the surface, or at least more of them did. But in fact, as soon as the PBS came in, they were all gone. So he demonstrated the, for the first time this ability to distinguish between them using one of these micro cavities. Then he began to ask, can single virus be detected? The, the whole idea was that we weren't going to be satisfied uh, in, in this quest with simply detecting a layer of virus. 
We wanted to detect single virus, and we actually wanted to measure their size. Now, if a virus particle comes in, and you've got photons circulating around in a polygon like this on the inside, there's an evanescent field on the outside, which begins to polarize the virus. And we came up with a sensing principle. The photonic energy in the cavity changes, which means the frequency changes, by the energy required to polarize the virus. This took about two months to work, out, work through electromagnetics to get this little principle in that many words. But what does it imply? The answer is, well, if you start with something like this and a virus is coming in and lands somewhere on the surface of that sphere, okay, you expect a frequency shift, especially if it lands at the equator where the light is circulating. And what our calculations showed that we should be able to detect a tenth of an HIV virus if we could make resonators, which were only 40 millionths of a meter in radius, and make them out of silica, glass, and also operate a short, a short wavelength. That's short for us. So we, we put together this thing over a period of a month or so and asked, does it work? And it turned out before we got done with it, a former student of mine who I supervised at Rockefeller wanted to do it. He read the paper. And so he set up this most elegant thing. He just simply took an O-ring, stuck it down on a piece of glass, and then put a droplet of liquid in, creating a hemisphere of liquid. And he said, well, that's my microfluidic cell. It's static. Then he injected with a syringe into that various virus particles. And in this case, it was influenza. Influenza we could handle, especially at Harvard where he was, because it was killed influenza. And uh, he began to immediately see steps in the wavelength shift. He was detecting them one at a time. More importantly than that, I guess, was when I took that sensing principle and applied it, I could get a radius of the, the virus based on the wavelength shift of the light that was measured. Actually, the fractional wavelength shift. And notice it was 1.5 parts in 10 to the eighth. That's over here. And when we were all done, created this equation, we got 47 nanometers for the radius of the influenza virus. The only people, only thing people knew from SEM, scanning electron microscopy, is that it was between 45 and 55. So we were right in that ballpark. Apparently, we had created something that could act as a size spectrometer. And all this time, patents were being filed on from the Polytechnic until about six or seven of them got filed on different aspects of this, more I'll show you, to cover us as we were doing it. Then what happened was I, I took measurements from around the world, done at different wavelengths for different size particles that were known, at least the mean size was known, and I computed what this RSP, this is called reactive sensing principle, that was the principle told me, and you notice that there's a slope of one meaning it agrees. So now we can detect influenza, HIV, polio, polio is harder, but we, as hard as we tried, we weren't able to do MS2 one virus at a time. So our goal was not quite fulfilled. But then there was a challenge that came from MIT and, and University of California, Santa Barbara, they said, well, we're looking at experiments in this area. And what we see is that there are three reports in the literature where they, pre they predict, based on theory, that the binding could not have been as fast as, w as what was being measured, meaning there were too many steps coming too fast based on the concentration in solution. So, and, they, and, they, and they're smart enough to say such discrepancies suggests that an additional as yet undetermined ingredient, see, must be present in the experiments. So 
David happened to stop into my office, that same David Kang, and I said, go into the lab and see if you can see the scattering from the virus. Look directly down on the microcavity inside the cell and see if you can see the scattering. About an hour later, he ran back into my office and he said, they're in orbit. I said, really? They're in orbit, he says. And I said, well, when you double the amount of light, do they go faster in orbit? He said, yes. So I said, you mean to say they're drawn in and they're in orbit? He said, yes, there's David. And, and I said, but you're only operating with 30 microwatts of light. That's, that's like a 30th of what's coming out of this. You know, radiation pressure, the whole idea of tractor beams, like from Star Trek or something, being able to draw things in with 30 microwatts of light sounded impossible. Not only that, but before these particles got into the beam, the, the, the wavelength was constant and then began to chatter as it came in there. So he was looking directly down from the top. This is what he saw. And I'll, I'll just show you a video of essentially what it looked like. looking directly down on the top of this thing and you can see we're not resolving this but it's scattering from some object which is going to the other edge going down below coming around coming up the other edge going around again going down this edge coming around again he had created an orbital system in solution, or at least he discovered it. And it was it sort of boggled the mind. I mean, uh, microfluidics had always been the case where, in fact, if light was used, it was to illuminate things. It wasn't being used for the force that it could produce. So all of fluidics was changed at that point when we published this and now then papers were coming out from everywhere right after that. He had created light force fluidics, a new area, and uh, more importantly it generated another three patents on all kinds of things. I can't go into all of them, but uh, but it was a very exciting time uh, when we saw that. In Star Trek, I always remember, the spaceship could draw things in by using a tractor beam. We had created a tractor beam. So you may wonder, what was it composed of? So here's this light which coming through a fiber that's stimulating this spherical mode and several things are happening. First, there's a force called a gradient force. Light, uh, particles like to be where the intensity is highest. So they tend to move toward that surface. That's called the gradient force. And we'll go through the mathematical details. This, it, on silica, there's a charge on the surface because at neutral pH, it's deprotonated. So instead of having SiOH, you have SiO minus. So it's, it's negatively charged. And virus are negatively charged. So there's a constant repulsion. So repulsion here, attraction from the light. And finally, there's a photon momentum flux moving around because this is a traveling wave. As it moves around, the evanescent field travels with it. And so this is the kind of thing that was happening. Well, they, that's an illustration. That's actual data. I mean, we just kind of synchronized the two. Okay. The ability for an antigen to bind to an antibody is now enhanced. Why? Because we've created dimensional reduction. We have made a railroad track, okay? A railroad track that leads to an antibody. Watch. 
at least as an illustration, this thing gets caught by that trap, starts to move around in order to find that particular antibody. It can find it much faster that way than random diffusion. Or if it's starting out up here, and I'm just showing it now looking from the side, it's going to move around until it gets into that track and then find that antibody much more quickly. Or if you wanted to, you could invent a symbol. I picked something close to a field effect transistor, th this symbol. Light comes in to this symbol. The symbol is that, <laughs> which enables this virus to move down to the antibody, right? And now you can think of ways in which you can make circuits of these symbols, right? Therefore, circuits of resonators. This is also a way to do fabrication. Suppose, for instance, you wanted to put something on the surface and you don't have the fabrication tools or you want to do it in a microfluidic cell, right? Then how would you do it? The answer is use light forces. We called that light force assembly and we also issued a, a patent application on that. This is the person who discovered a way to enhance signals well beyond anything we could imagine, right? This is Sika Shapova. She imagined using a gold nanoparticle and its plasmonic properties so that when it's put onto the microcavity, the field is further enhanced where it's put on by the circulating wave. Here's what her data look like. This was the greatest signal we could ever get from a distribution of particles of the size which is being represented here, a size of dielectric particles. She put this plasmonic particle on and she suddenly noticed that there are all these that we couldn't explain. They were due to an enhancement due to the plasmonic particle. So that in addition to the small steps, we could get gigantic steps. It was only a factor of two or three from the edge of this to the largest thing you get here. But in fact, it was a harbinger of things to come. The idea of adding nano optics to micro optics to, inf to create a much bigger signal and to see things we couldn't see before. So here, you plant this plasmonic particle, the form of something like a sphere. When light comes around and drives it into resonance, it creates a big field on the top and the bottom of this thing. And with this, we managed to detect. This is when we put that system in, we could see that plasmonic particle on the surface. And then suddenly, where we couldn't possibly see MS2 before because it was too small, much too small. As a matter of fact, our, our noise was on the order of five femtometers. And MS2 would have generated on a bare cavity a quarter of a femtometer. We would never have been able to see it. But yet, there they are. They appeared. The plasmonic particle created a receptor, which was an amplifier. And it was nanoscopic. The enhancement turned out to be 70 times. So no longer four times, now up to 70. You can just count them. This is taking a derivative of that binding curve, and you can see every one of the viruses as they come in. And then over here, there is no virus injected. Cancer markers can also be detected one at a time. When you have thyroid cancer, they cut your thyroid out. OK, that's what they do. Supposedly, they've cut the entire cancer out. Ah, but there's a protein generated by the thyroid. So after two weeks or so, they begin looking to see if the protein is there. If it is, there are remnants of it in your system the cancer's still there, right? Now imagine being able to see those protein one molecule at a time. One 
thyroglobulin protein at a time. So here, uh, the maximum signal would have been one hundredth of what we could possibly detect before, but because of the plasmonic particle, we began to see steps. You can see them there, okay, from that plasmonic particle known as a nanoshell. Now we were up to 266 times. The reason we got so much higher, we didn't quite understand. I mean, after all, we didn't expect to get so much higher. We, our theory was saying that we shouldn't get this kind of thing. What we hadn't realized is that these shells are not perfect on their surface. They're bumpy. When plasmonic particles are bumpy, they create hot spots that are very close to the surface. So they would react to very small molecules more sensitively than they react to a, a virus, which is considerably larger. So that's the reason we managed to see them. The bumps were only 4 nanometers to 10 nanometers in size. And this is what they do when you do a calculation. It shows that as you get close to the surface, you get this big enhancement of potential signal over what you would have had before just due to a bump. Another fortunate thing, we published this in 2013. Uh, it's been taking off in the literature and we're down to well below where I ever expected we would be. We're down to a sensitivity of eight zeptograms. Okay, remember what I said when I started this, the protein on the surface, the epitopes, single protein, have a mass of something on the order of 30 kilodalton, something like that. That is 10 or 20 times higher than this. Our sensitivity now here, 8 zeptograms. Oh, so you want to know what that is, then you know, you go Atograms is 10 to the minus 18. Zeptograms, 10 to the minus 21 grams. We need more landing pads. So at the University of Michigan and also at Abu Dhabi, they're making rings based on these designs where they're enhancing signals by essentially putting plasmonic particles on the rings. Okay, um, this you'll hear more about uh, soon as the people at Abu Dhabi begin to finish, also at the University of Michigan. So one of the thank nature methods for publishing our, our technique. An industry has come about, a, a company by the name of Genolite has created rings after rings after rings, a multiplexed type se sensor that can sense a whole slew of different interactions. And David Kang has created something called MP3 laser. You remember the name of our laboratory? MP3 lab. Uh, and uh, we have one of these in our lab and it's fantastic. I mean, I don't know how he did all of this. I mean, it was a, he, he made it like an iPhone. So when you, t when you call him and you say, look, we'd like to do this experiment, but in fact your system doesn't do it, he sends us an app. <laughs> we load it into this system and it does that new experiment. Uh, it's fantastic. So we'd like to thank uh, people at Rockefeller University who's helped us near the beginning. Uh, David Kang, I highlight here. Uh, Frank Vollmer was a grad student there. He's a biochemist who wanted to learn physics, so I mentored him. Um, Stephen Holler uh, contributed. He was one of our students, interesting guy. Uh, he created a company, a sensor company, and sold it for $26 million in his 30s. So he did all right. And then all of these people are people at the Polytechnic who contributed to the work. You can vis visit us on YouTube. This is a short, I'm never sure whether web pages will change their names here, so instead, <laughs> a place in Texas runs this page. It's mp3l.org. 
and you can visit our YouTube at which is MP3L WGM, so MP3L for Microparticle Photophysics Lab and WGM for Whispering Gallery Mode. And that's it. So do you have any questions or anything? You should be assured of the fact that I'm dumb as a rock. So go ahead. So you can ask any question. What you got? So the gold net particle, would it be able to uh, also start orbiting and would that yes. increase? Yes. Yes, it can. In fact, that's how we put it on the surface. We put it on the surface by, by drawing it in from an orbit mm -hmm. with a little pulse of, of intensity so we could get it close enough to stick. Yeah. That's a very good question. Yes? Uh, in the case of those rings that you talked about that uh, yeah. companies are developing. Yes. Uh, Genelite. Yeah. So what are those rings actually? Mean? Okay. So uh, um, there's silicon, which is very high refractive ex index on silica. Silicon on silica. So silica has a refractive index about 1.45, but silicon is, is way over 2. So the light is confined within the silicon ring. And then, of course, there's evanescent fields around the ring. Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. Yes? Of the, the orbit, like. oh the orbit, yeah. you mean about light force fluidics, mm -hmm. this new subject. Yeah. Uh, we know that like gold will be like the normal size. The the future will be like vast change. Change. I'm not quite getting it, but uh, the gold particle will be grabbed on to by the tractor beam, the light force and be drawn to the surface. If there's a repulsion between the surface, as there was in the case of these negative particles and the negative surface, then it can remain out there and, and, and orbit. And I'm quite confused about why, why you put a bump in it and then... A bump in... Uh, on the surface. And then ah. the sensitivity will be like... Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, the normal sensitivity of of the bare cavity was not sufficient to see a single molecule. Mm -hmm. But when you put a plasmonic particle on, it has this property that a particular frequency, and it's pretty broad frequency spectrum, uh, there's a, a large field created on the north and south pole of this nanoscopic thing, okay, so that if you're sending a particular field in, you get a much larger field. And therefore, that remember that principle that I had, which the sensing principle said that the amount to which you polarize, the energy that polarizes the particle, is the wavelength shift of the photons and the mode. So if you have a higher field, you polarize it more strongly. I hope that helps. Yeah. Anything? Yes? Sorry, I'm sorry. Is this biosensor available in market for any medication? Yes, uh, from Genelite. Right, it is. Yeah, they're, they're putting it into hospitals. Yeah, yes? Uh, are there any other kinds of different gold nanostructures they use? For yeah, some people use uh, nano rods, uh, which are, you know, rod shaped. Some people use nano shells, which are gold on the outside and they have glass on the inside. Uh, and some people use just solid gold. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, you said in the initial part that the initial ones couldn't detect the MS2. So after increasing the sensitivity now can it helps in detecting the MS2, does it? Yes. Apparently just recently single Atomic ions were detected inside of the fluid, right? Not by our group, but by a group in Germany. So yeah, it, it enhances the sensitivity tremendously. That used gold nanorods, yeah. Is it possible 
to distinguish between which virus, say if there's a mixture of viruses in the fluid, is it possible to distinguish which one binds? Yes, yes. So, so it turns out what you do is you put specific antibodies on the surface. Now you can generate the antibodies by essentially uh, poisoning bacteria with the, with the virus and then harvesting the antibodies and then binding those to the surface. Well, I, I meant at the same time. Could it, is it only for one specific? No, no. At one time? You should be able to distinguish different things uh, if, you can, if you can identify the spatial regions where you put those, those antibodies. Yes. That's another subject, yeah, right. So, uh, I have two questions. So, the first one is, um, so for this technology, we're going to rotate the particle. So, this particle has to be uh, a hard particle, which means it has to be uh, either polymerized particle or uh, metallic particle. Well, I mean, the microcavities are, are dielectric. They're, they're glass. Yeah. Because the metals have too much loss so you don't want to make a solid micro uh, cavity out of metal. It's, it's fine if you just use nanoscopic metal particles. Na nanoscopic. nanoscopic, meaning uh, uh, nanometers in size. But the micro cavities we were using were typically 40 micrometers. Okay, so they are, uh, they are a thousand times the size of those little uh, gold nanoparticles that are put on the surface. Okay? So the nanoparticles act, act as receptors. So if you then put antibodies on the nanoparticles that are specific to a certain virus, then the signal gets enhanced when the virus reaches that plasmonic particle, the little particle, the nanoscopic particle which is on the microcavity. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem with, with soft materials for the microcavity is that uh, they will tend to, because their elastic coefficients are not very stiff, they will tend to fluctuate on their surface. That will broaden these resonance lines, okay? And so not as useful, but we've made them out of PDMS, which is soft, and they're pretty good, yeah. Yes. So uh, we like we uh, enhance the signal, but at the same time we enhance the ability, the physical absorbance of mm -hmm. the piece. How do we avoid this? How do we avoid this? Avoid it. Ah, okay. So, I mean, typically what you do in these these systems is you try to block all parts of the surface. You block it chemically except for the places where you want the receptors to be. You don't want non-specific ad adsorption. Okay, so you have a problem, you know, I mean, if you, if you have a well-designed um, well surface, okay, so surface science comes into this, then you can block all of the parts of the surface except the where, you, where you've put your receptors. Any others? Uh, okay, so what I'm seeing here, aside from this guy, who's, who's ready now, uh, you guys are being beaten here. All these girls, who, they, they're asking all kinds of questions. Yeah. So um, when you entrap the analyte, when it locates the antibody, is there a difference for perhaps another, suppose you have another antibody, is there a difference in the rates of locating the antibody on that particle? Um, once again, if, uh, unless you have a way of, um, the, the, rate will, the rate will be conditioned by the on compared to off time. So remember, most of these antibodies physically 
bind, right, the, the antigen to the antibody. So there's a certain time over which they'll remain there before they come off. There are some things that bind very nicely, like streptavidin and biotin, right, things like that, very strong. But a lot of things, uh, you know, basically have an on to off rate. So the answer is, yeah, uh, the reason why people would want a thing like this is because they want to test antibodies and see which ones are most effective. The ones that are most effective would have an on rate much greater than their off rate. So you've hit on a very important purpose of this overall thing, to test basically the quality of antibodies for particular antigens. Does that help? Okay. Any, any other uh, questions? Guys, come on. I mean, you guys, look, I don't know about this. I mean, usually, the, yeah, go ahead. Um, so you would want to put the antibodies on the equator just because that's where the flow of the antigen would be? Well, that's where the light is moving, right? Uh, at least in what I, what I demonstrated, mm -hmm. right? It is possible by using different frequencies to move the light to different places. Mm -hmm. But no, if, it, if it, it, the neat thing about this is that what we call that carousel trap, we call it that because it's like a carousel, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it, it can draw things to the surface and then they stick at a particular latitude, right? So thinking about the Earth as having an equator, a North Pole, South Pole. The only difference between our micro world and that is that our micro world is only 80 millionths of a meter across and the Earth is 8,000 miles across. But aside from that, the geometry is the same, right? So, yeah, so what you'd, what you'd want to do is um, pull the particle to precisely where the light is, and that's exactly what this carousel trap does. It's very fortunate. Uh, I hope that helped. Okay. Any any other questions, guys? What what's happening here? Ah ah ah! A guy guy. How do you solve the impurity of the sample? How do you solve the impurity of the sample? Like you want to test the viruses, right? Yes. Yes. Well, okay, let me, let me um, since that's a very hard question to answer, right? And I, I recognize that, but I wanted to point out something. Inside of your system right now, right now, okay? And I, my friend here can tell us just how many interactions are occurring per second with the DNA, right? And there are a lot of impurities in there, right? And it, and and the, you can recognize the right protein based on receptors which are in the biological system. So you're depending really on this idea of using biology to create the stickiness of that surface that's specific to particular antigen, okay? And, and it's pretty selective. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here, right? Think about that, right? It's a wonderful question, but I never heard of a I never heard of a crap protein. No, no. What? So, I mean, it's, <laughs> that's a new. Do, do you know Do you know the word crap? Or <laughs> anyway, who's on uh, first? Uh, the first is, the <laughs> first question is this: uh, Can you go through why? The thing is called uh, which Uh-huh, yes, uh, yes. Yes, and, uh, yes, yes. I can I can do that, but I had not done that. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take us all the way from from London to Be to Beijing. <laughs> oh, not gonna take too long. Okay. So if you if you go to London and you go up into St. Paul's Cathedral and it's about one level up, there is a gallery which is completely round. It has sort of concave walls a bit. And if you whisper into the corner, uh, then you can be heard 40 meters away on the other side by a person standing there putting his ear toward the surface. Because what happens is the acoustic wave comes around. 
So obviously this is not acoustic, right? But it seemed like the right title for it because it was already a phenomenon that people knew. They called it a whispering gallery. Now, I'm going to take you to Beijing. In Beijing, there's a place called the Temple of Heaven. Okay, guys, tell us about the Temple of Heaven. What do they have there? Just like London, yeah. but much, much larger. Everything is larger in China. <laughs> okay, much, much larger, right? And people stand at the wall and they whisper to each other. I think it's more than 70 meters or more across. I mean, it's really incredible. I'm sorry, I should have put a slide in on that. Can we get back from China to Grand Central so we can go and experience? Right, but Grand Central is not a complete. Okay, so what happened in Grand Central, I think, now I'm interpreting this, is that Vanderbilt, so man, a wealthy man, gave the property of, to the people to build Grand Central. But he demanded only one thing, that in the basement of Grand Central there'd be an oyster bar where he could have his oysters. Okay. The ceiling of the oyster bar was like this. Okay. The story is, whether I don't, I don't know if it's entirely true, that he would sit his competitors at one side and he would sit himself on the other because he remained quiet. <laughs> and that's called a whispering gallery, but it's, it's uh, you might call it semicircular, right? So not resonant in the same way it was. Yeah. In fact, just before you get into the whistle bar, kind of a Just on the outside. Yeah, a little outside, which right. is what? About shape like some whole cathedral. Right. And you, every time you go there, you'll see people whispering on, on one side of the wall and listening on that. It's much smaller, of course. I guess about that. 20, 20 foot across. But you can go and try it. That actually works. But the principle still is talking about a way of going around the, the sphere, right. right? Well, in this case, around a yeah. hemispherical top. Anyway, that was the first question. <laughs> Did I say a hand? Guys, you're still being beat here. Uh, and um, uh, my second while we're thinking is, uh, can you go through again uh, why the resonance, a resonant peak is generated mm. in, the, in, the, in the sphere? So that I can ask you that. I mean, why it's inverted? Yeah, yeah. No. yeah what, what, what you are seeing, essentially. Yeah, yeah. It's because as the light, uh, one way to think of it is as the light uh, this, um, uh, generates the resonance, the, the energy goes into the sphere and not into the rest of the fiber. That's one way to think of it. Yeah, so essentially, the, I mean, mm -hmm. what we're seeing is that once you get into the We see a dip, small, right? You have a, again, the sphere steals energy from what goes through the fiber, and hence you get, yeah. get a signal. Right? Does that make sense? Very similar to what we talked about last time. Okay, well, I want to, uh, I can see it's been very participatory, <laughs> and I thank you for that. Um, and uh, let's, a uh, little hand for our <laughs> professor. <laughs> okay, and... Um, Thanks so much, Steve. Some, sometime in the future. <laughs>